Good evening, everyone. My name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director of the Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, Redwood Library in Athenaeum, very important. Uh, the public humanities, broadly speaking, is what uh, is our stock and trade. Um, I want to first uh, give a shout out to the kind sponsorship of the Jarzombek family, Marianne, Mark, and Michelle Drum of Gustav White down the street, uh, our friends. Uh, for their uh, generous support of much of the programming that we've been putting on during the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. Now, at the conclusion of tonight's lecture, um, we'll be happy to answer some questions. Let me rephrase that. Mary V. Thompson will be happy to answer some questions. Um, she's the expert, and um, you can type them in at the bottom sidebar where it says say something nice or in the middle of your screen you will see uh ask a question at the bottom center and i can uh read out the questions and mrs thompson will answer them now for uh, just a quick technical note um you can go up to the help button if you find that you're having some issues with sound you click on help and uh you hit connectivity or one of those up there and then you're all set so uh, have a look if you have any issues with sound at help now tonight it is my pleasure to welcome mary v thompson the research historian at george washington's mount vernon she is going to discuss her acclaimed new book the only unavoidable subject of regret George Washington's Slavery and the Enslaved Community at Mount Vernon. In the words of the London Review of Books, quote, Mary Thompson's book is the most detailed examination yet published of slavery at Mount Vernon. Her command of the sources makes it possible, makes possible an almost encyclopedic description of the conditions of slave life, end quote. And uh, it is true, it is a remarkable piece of research and we're honored to have her with us this evening. So please welcome uh, Mrs. Mary V. Thompson from Mount Vernon. Thank you all so much and thank you, Mary. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, I'd like to thank the Redwood Library and Athenaeum for inviting me to speak this evening about my book. Um, the book is the result of almost 30 years of, of work um, on and off and has been a, a huge part of my life. Um, my husband of almost 25 years now had never known me when I wasn't obsessing about this topic and the status of the book. So then I had to figure out who I am at this stage of my life with the book actually finished while doing lots of new author things on the computer, like checking on Amazon to see the status of the book, um, it, pretty much anything under a, a ranking of 100,000 seems to be pretty good, especially for a book done with an academic press. Another favorite is to get on a site called WorldCat, where you can see how many libraries worldwide have your book. In case any of you are wondering, um, as of last week, the book is currently in at least 235 libraries in 10 co countries, the US, Australia, Canada, Dubai, Ecuador, England, Ger Germany, Nigeria, Switzerland, and Turkey. Of course, the book's publication in the late spring of 2019 was soon followed by the coronavirus in the winter of 2020, which occasioned more obsession of a different kind. Uh, throughout my time at Mount Vernon, my research that which is coming up on March 3rd, um, on 41 years. Um, throughout my time at Mount Vernon, my research has been driven by topics the public really wants to know more about, as evidenced by their questions to our staff, either in person, over the phone, or via snail mail or email. Their interest has resulted in books on a number of topics, including George Washington's religious beliefs, which were dealt with in in the Hands of a Good Providence, Religion and the Life of George Washington, which came out in 2008. People often ask me about what the Washingtons, often asked us about what the Washingtons ate. And that resulted in dining with the Washingtons, historic recipes, entertaining and hospitality from Mount Vernon, which came out in 2011. 
for which I wrote two chapters and more than 20 sidebars. They've also indicated that they wanted to know more about family members other than George Washington, hence the publication of a short biography of Martha Washington in 2017. One of the topics our visitors clearly wanted to know more about was slavery, and especially George Washington's role as a slave owner. More specifically, they wanted answers to the questions, was George Washington a good slave owner? Or, he was good to his slaves, wasn't he? To anyone looking to, at this book to provide those answers, I just want to say up front that some of the worst things one thinks about in terms of slavery, things like whipping, keeping someone in shackles, track, tracking a person down with dogs, or selling someone away so that they would never see their family again. All of those things happened at either Mount Vernon or on other plantations under the management of George Washington. While it was rare, we know that at least two Mount Vernon slaves were sold to the West Indies as a punishment for their behavior. It would have been akin to being sentenced to life in prison, if not a death sentence. In another case, Washington threatened a young man with being sold in the Caribbean in the hopes that such a dire threat would lead to an improvement in both his work habits and after hours proclivities. Just within the last couple of years, in going over and cataloging objects excavated some years ago at Mount Vernon, our archaeologist found two sets of shackles. As we'll discuss a little later, some manuscripts written by a young artist in the 1830s recorded stories recalled by George Washington's nephew, including one that makes it impossible for me to look at the bo lovely bowling green in front of the mansion without great sadness. The book is the result of many years of study undertaken as part of my job here at Mount Vernon. My interest in the topic, however, began many years before. It was during my early years in elementary school that I first learned about slavery and the legacy of prejudice that still endured as the nation commemorated the centennial of the war that abolished slavery in the United States, even as the civil rights movement played out each night on the evening news. My interest in history had early been fostered by my father, um, but it was in graduate school at the University of Virginia that I fell in love with African American history. There I started learning the academic story of slavery, partly through a seminar co-taught by Robert Cross and Steve Innes, and most importantly by a course called Slave Systems taught by Joseph Miller. The latter was probably the best class I have ever been privileged to take, and I will always be grateful to Mr. Miller um, at, at Mr. Jefferson's university, professors are um, in, in automatically addressed as Mr. or Ms. because um, we're all equal in this democratic system, um, for opening up this new world to me, as well as for the kindness and understanding he showed to all his students. I came to work at Mount Vernon shortly before receiving my degree from, the, from UVA and immediately faced an interesting situation where no one spoke of slaves. They were referred to as servants if they were mentioned at all. And I could see that roughly 35 to 40 years of historiography on this topic were unacknowledged. Things would change at Mount Vernon in the ensuing years, and I'm pleased that I have been there to see and be part of that transformation. This volume began life in the late 1980s when my boss, Mount Vernon's longtime curator, Christine Meadows, attended a conference in Charlottesville on the interpretation of slavery at historic homes. She came back full of enthusiasm and asked me to drop my research project on foodways at that time to focus instead on slavery at Mount Vernon. Writing on this subject began in 1993 as a series of essays on slave life was prepared as background for a group of incoming interns who would be spending the summer reconstructing George Washington's 16-sided barn and growing appropriate crops in the fields surrounding it in an area formerly known as Hell Hole, but now called the Pioneer Farm Site, and it's soon to be getting a new name. Miss Meadows gave the go-ahead to spend about four months pulling together and making sense of the research I'd been doing up to that point. In addition to serving as the basis for the interpretation of the Pioneer Farm the essays, which continued to grow, were also the foundation for Mount Vernon's slave life tours for its first-person interpreters who portray specific enslaved individuals and several small museum exhibits, 
as well as a large exhibition staged across the entire museum, which opened in 2016 and will be up until July of this year. If you've not had the opportunity to see Lives Bound Together, I highly recommend that you make the time to experience it. Since then, I've continued to research this topic while consulting the works of other historians as they became available and responding to comments and suggestions made by colleagues throughout the country. So let's turn our attention now to George Washington as a slave owner. To set up the situation at Mount Vernon, it's necessary to understand the organization of the plantation. George Washington first became a slave owner at the age of 11 when his father died and left him 10 slaves. Over the years, he inherited a number of other slaves and purchased many others. Lists made the summer before he died show that there were a total of 317 enslaved people at Mount Vernon. Of that number, 40 were rented from a neighbor, 123 belonged to George Washington, and 153 belonged to the estate of Martha Washington's first husband, Daniel Park Custis, who died in 1757 before he made a will. According to both British common law and those of the state of Virginia, in such cases, the widow of the deceased was allowed the lifetime use, not ownership, of one third of her late husband's property, including the slaves. But upon her own death, that property again, including those who were enslaved, was to be divided among the remaining heirs of that first husband. In the case of the Custis Dower slaves, those heirs were Martha's four grandchildren. One of the most interesting things about George Washington's experience as a slave owner is that there is considerable overlap between his life in the military and his life on the plantation. In both cases, he was working with people in highly regimented situations, many of whom did not want to be there. An army is a very hierarchical society, and so was a plantation. According to one member of Congress, George Washington organized his plantation very much as he did his army during the Revolution. Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania was a staunch anti-federalist who generally had nothing nice to say about the first president. In his diary, McClay cattily recorded a bit of gossip passed on by an acquaintance who had visited Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is under different overseers who may be styled generals under whom are grades of subordinate appointments descending down through whites, mulattoes, mixed race people, um, Negroes, horses, cows, sheep, hogs, etc. The Friday of every week is appointed for the overseers, or shall we say the brigadier generals, to make up their returns or reports. Not a day's work but is noted what, by whom, and where done. Not a cow calves or a ewe drops her lamb but is registered, deaths, etc. Whether accidental or by the hands of the butcher, all minuted. Thus, the etiquette and arrangement of an army is preserved on his farm. McClay was not the only one of Washington's contemporaries to see echoes of his military experience in the organization and management of Mount Vernon. A former neighbor, Englishman Richard Parkinson, believed that keeping order on a plantation required what he called the same severe discipline as an army, and he credited Washington's success at managing enslaved workers not only to his industrious, methodical nature, but also to his, quote, being brought up in the army. Washington's management style may have formed during the years with the army in the French and Indian War, but it was perf perfected on the plantation prior to the revolution and reached its highest development after that war. An early letter to a military subordinate, written when Washington was only 26, hinted at the mature style to come. You will take care, therefore, to keep up discipline, at the same time use lenity to prevent discontent and desertion. Be vigilant and keep your men sober, observe order and regularity in the garrison, which keep clean and wholesome, and as your numbers will be few, keep a regular and strict watch. These instructions, so appropriate for the small and struggling army on the frontier, applied equally well to Washington's plantation 30 years later, where the free white population was outnumbered by enslaved Africans and African Americans by a factor of about 10 to 1. 20 years after those instructions to his frontier army, 
as commanding general of the Continental Army during the Revolution, Washington continued to keep a regular and strict watch on those he led. He frequently observed details which concerned him and consequently ordered changes in routine practices which might seem unworthy of notice by a modern commanding officer. By way of comparison, Washington was in roughly the same position as General Dwight Eisenhower in the Second World War, with charge over the military forces, including not only the Army but the Navy and Marines as well, for more than one country. There were, of course, significant changes in military organization over the years, and Eisenhower was dealing with a considerably larger force. Still, it's difficult to imagine the Supreme Allied Commander taking the time to write detailed instructions on such things as the construction of huts, the placement and maintenance of latrines, sweeping the lanes and buildings in camp, the proper disposal of offal and carrion, including dead horses, and how the men carried their kettles. No, no matter was too small to escape Washington's attention, including the personal habits of his troops. At Morristown, he ordered that no soldier shall bathe in the heat of the day, nor stay long in the water at a time. Finding those instructions too nebulous, however, about a year later, Washington directed that none of his soldiers remain longer than 10 minutes in the water. For most of the years he was in residence at his 8,000 acre Mount Vernon plantation, George Washington made a daily circuit of the farms that made up the whole. While he may not have gotten to every one of the five every day, in the course of a week he checked progress at each and later recorded his observations in a diary. In a letter to a friend following his retirement from the presidency, he described his typical daily schedule. I begin my diurnal course with the sun. If my hirelings are not in their places at that time, I send them messages expressive of my sorrow for their indisposition. Then, having put this, these wheels in motion, I examine the state of things further. By the time I have accomplished these matters, breakfast is ready. This over, I mount my horse and ride round my farms, which employs me until it is time to dress for dinner. Um, dinner was at three o'clock in the afternoon. George Washington was not the only plantation owner who felt a need to keep a sharp eye on everyday operations. Shortly after he took control of some land he inherited from his father, Martha Washington's son, John Park Custis, complained that he had been struggling with every inconvenience that a person can meet with in coming to a plantation in every respect out of order. In a letter that must have gladdened the heart of the stepfather who raised him, Custis wrote that he had found by experience already that the master's eye is necessary in most things. This, too, had a military precedent. During the Revolution, Washington wrote to one of his generals, Alexander McDougall, to say how much he appreciated the latter's belief in the importance of keeping officers constantly in the field with their men, that I shall order a sufficient number of horsemen's tents or marquees for the officers so that they will then have no excuse for absence except want of health. By his own admission, George Washington kept such close personal watch on the plantation because he felt that was the only way to prevent problems from occurring, or once they had begun, to stop them at an early stage before things went seriously wrong. As he reminded a new farm manager in the fall of 1793, nothing was inconsequential. It was necessary to look into the smaller matters belonging to the farms, which though individually may be trifling, are not found so in the aggregate, for there is no adage more true than an old Scottish one that many mickles make a muckle. He complained of one hired white overseer that the man was too much of a social creature, both making and receiving frequent visits from friends. Such behavior took his attention from his business, leaving the slaves on the farm to their own devices. Little work was done and several slaves were punished as a consequence, something which would not, in Washington's opinion, have been necessary if the overseer had done his job properly. Besides being unpleasant, Washington realized that punishment or correction would never replace the time that was lost and often led to evils which are worse than the disease. In a similar vein, he cautioned another overseer that he, quote, he must stir early and late as I expect my people 
will work from daybreaking till it is dusk in the evening, and that is the only way to keep them at work without severity or wrangling, is always to be with them. When he used the words always with them, Washington meant that work, especially occupations that required skill and attention, were to be done under the immediate eye of the overseers. Washington's incredible capacity for registering detail was noted in several tales related by former slaves. Many years after his master's death, one, quote, venerable old colored man, 77 years of age, remembered that the slaves did not quite like Washington, primarily because he was so exact and so strict. The most close attention must be paid to the condition of all the roads, fences, buildings, etc. And if a rail, a clapboard, or a stone was permitted to remain out of its place, he complained, sometimes in, ma in language of severity. Perhaps to soften the effect of his recollections on his white audience, the old man added that Washington was, quote, however, a most excellent man. One of the things Washington stressed, both to his officers in the army and to his overseers at Mount Vernon, was the need to keep their distance from the people they were supervising. As in so many aspects of their lives, George Washington wanted those in authority on the plantation to emulate his management style. While they were expected to be with the slaves constantly during work hours and nearby the rest of the time, Washington stressed over and over the necessity for hired whites to maintain their emotional distance from the people they were overseeing, much as he did himself. In 1794, for example, he advised his farm manager to caution a newly hired artisan, quote, against familiarities with the Negroes. One of his major complaints about Thomas Green, a carpenter supervisor, was that the craftsman could not exert enough authority over the slaves because he is too much upon a level with the Negroes to exert it. This may have been the problem with another hired white as well whom Washington found almost useless at supervising slaves. I am persuaded he has no more authority over the Negroes than an old woman would have, and is as unable to get a proper day's work done by them as she would, unless led to it by their own inclination, which I know is not the case. It is very likely that Washington's concern with over-familiarity between the hired whites and slaves on the plantation had been reinforced by his military background where officers traditionally kept their distance from the men they supervised. Too close a relationship could jeopardize the authority a leader needed in order to function properly. An officer could open himself up to charges of either favoritism toward or prejudiced against particular individual, individuals under his command. Soldiers who knew all their superiors' faults might not follow him into a dangerous situation could have such a low opinion of him that he was an object of ridicule, or might even try to blackmail him. An officer who was too intimately involved with his men could find himself unable to give orders necessary for completing a mission because he was thinking too much about the cost to his troops. Evidence from Mount Vernon suggests that Washington was thinking of situations like these when he counseled those in authority on the plantation to keep their distance. For example, in the early 1790s, the hired head carpenter, Thomas Green, had a severe drinking problem, which got worse over time. Washington felt that Green's situation made it impossible for him to chastise the men he supervised because they had too much information with which to blackmail him. Quote, he dare not find fault with those who are entrusted to his care, lest they should retort and disclose his rascally conduct. As a consequence, work that the same number of hands would perform in a week takes mine a month. Washington even cautioned a new farm manager about the dangers of getting too close to the overseers he super supervised. To treat them civilly is no more than what all men are entitled to, but my advice to you is to keep them at a proper distance, for they will grow upon familiarity in proportion as you will sink in authority if you do not. One unfortunate bit of fact of life, both in the army and on plantations worked by enslaved workers, was corporal punishment. During the Revolution, Washington had ordered that soldiers sentenced to flogging 
receive their punishment in front of several units in order to make as great an impression and on as many people as possible. In one such case, when a soldier was to be punished with a hundred lashes, Washington directed that one quarter of the sentence be given on four successive days in different parts of the line before troops from New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, respectively. A major factor in making sure that a correction had as much effect as possible on both the individual receiving the punishment and on all who witnessed it was that, quote, whipping had to be used with restraint and in a coolly calculated manner. The concept of what con constituted cruel punishment has, of course, changed dramatically in the century since Washington's death. Until the very end of the 18th century, whipping was a common form of punishment in both the northern and southern parts of what became the United States. In the colonial Anglican church in Virginia, those who did not attend church at least once a month or who disrupted the service were subject to a fine, but if they refused to pay, they were given 10 lashes on his or her bare back well laid on. During the American Revolution, soldiers routinely received sentences of a hundred lashes on their bare backs for a variety of infractions, ranging from desertion to stealing and being drunk on duty, killing livestock, using insulting languages toward and attempting to strike a superior officer, being out of camp at an unseasonable hour, and killing an ox belonging to a local civilian and disorderly conduct. A generation later, in 1804, just prior to the start of Meriwether Lewis and William Clark's expedition across the continent to the Pacific Ocean, three of their men were tried in military court and subjected to whipping. Two were found guilty of being absent without leave one evening. Um, they received 25 lashes each. A third was sentenced to 50 lashes for being absent without leave, for behaving in an unbecoming manner at the ball last night, well, one wonders what he did, and for speaking in a language after his return, tending to bring into disrepute the orders of the commanding officer. Within the last couple of years, Mount Vernon became aware of some notes taken down by artist John Gadsby Chapman as he interviewed George Washington's nephew, Lawrence Lewis, during an 1833 visit to Virginia. Lewis became a member of the Mount Vernon household after his uncle's retirement from the presidency and later cemented their connection by marrying Martha Washington's youngest granddaughter, Eleanor, known as Nellie Custis, in 1799. Lawrence Lewis knew the slaves from Mount Vernon well, having inherited quite a few of the Custis Dower slaves through his wife's share of her paternal grandfather's estate. He also served for decades as one of the executors of George Washington's estate which made him responsible for the continued care of elderly slaves who had been freed by the terms of his uncle's will. I found one of the stories told by Lawrence Lewis to be particularly troubling. He described a serious incident that would have taken place in the period between Washington's return from the revolution in late 1783 and before his presidency. This was the period when Washington was making changes to the way punishment was handled on the plantation. By requiring a system of review, perhaps something akin to a court-martial, in order to protect his slaves from capricious and, to 18th century eyes, extreme physical punishment. When his secretary, Tobias Lear, wrote a letter to a friend back home in New England concerning life at Mount Vernon in early 1788, he mentioned that no whipping is allowed without a regular complaint and the defendant found guilty of some bad deed. The story told by Lawrence Lewis many years later illustrates that process. When he, meaning Washington, laid off and arranged the beautiful lawn in front of the house, the servants were in the habit of passing and unpassing without regard to the pathways and to the great injury of its beauty and regular growth of the grass. An order was issued that no one should walk on the grass or off the path. The general, in a morning walk, discovered the print of footsteps out of place, yet no one had done it, meaning nobody fessed up that they were the ones who had walked across the grass. The print of the footstep was measured and examined. All the servants were called up, 
a shoe was found fitting the impression exactly, and the offender was severely punished. The law was afterward respected, and the offense not repeated. Although Lewis never said, the severe punishment probably involved whipping. Several years later, a well-known view of Mount Vernon's west front, this is the, the, uh, not, the not river side of, of the house, um, was produced about 1792. Now attributed to artist Edward Savage, it shows George and Martha Washington walking on the Bowling Green with a small group of friends and family members as well as some of their pet dogs. If you look closely at this scene, you'll notice what appeared to be both hired and enslaved workers walking on the pathways around the Bowling Green and the circular driveway in front of the mansion. After reading Lawrence Lewis's version of the backstory, I've never been able to look at this painting in quite the same way. Probably the biggest factor in the evolution of Washington's views on slavery was the Revolutionary War, in which he risked his life his family, a sizable fortune, and a stable future, fighting to obtain freedom from England based on some relatively new and idealistic concepts about the rights of man. During the conflict, his views on slavery were radically altered, evidence that he truly believed the wartime rhetoric about freedom and liberty. Washington himself made use of this language and could hardly fail to see the irony when he expressed the view to an old friend in the summer of 1774 that the British authorities, quote, from whom we have a right to seek protect protection, were endeavoring by every piece of art or despotism to fix the shackles of slavery upon the Americans. Two years later, in orders to his soldiers at Cambridge, he reminded them that it is a noble cause we are engaged in. It is the cause of virtue and mankind and that freedom or slavery must be the result of our conduct. In July of the same year, Washington challenged his army with the idea that the time had almost arrived, quote, which must probably determine whether Americans are to be free men or slaves. In contrast to their lives as free men who would have any property they can call their own, defeat would mean being consigned to a state of wretchedness from which no human efforts will probably deliver them. He closed by challenging them to show the whole world that a free man contending for liberty on his own ground is superior to any slavish mercenary on earth. If the Americans could not see it for themselves, the enemy did not hesitate to point out the rebels' hypocrisy on the matter of slavery. One of the best known statements on the subject was Samuel Johnson's quip, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Washington slave owning was used as another reason to hold this foremost leader of the revolution in contempt. Responding to a wartime rumor that Washington had been captured by the British, an English traveler in America named Nicholas Cresswell responded with sarcasm. After noting that Washington's great caution will always prevent him being made a prisoner to our inactive general. Cresswell described the American commander as a most surprising man, one of nature's geniuses, a heaven-born general, if there is any of that sort. What really irked Cresswell was that a Negro driver, and this is another phrase for an overseer or foreman, should, with a, and he's, that, so that's what he's referring, calling Washington, should, with a ragged banditti of undisciplined people, the scum and refuse of all nations on earth, so long, excuse me, so long keep a British general at bay, may even oblige him with as fine an army of veteran soldiers as ever England had on the American continent to retreat. It's astonishing. It is too much. By heavens, by heavens, there must be a double dealing somewhere. When Washington wrote a few years after the close of the war that liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth, he was simply noting what he had found to be true in his own life. Within three years of the start of the war, Washington, who was then 46 years old and had been a slave owner for 35 years, confided in a cousin back in Virginia that he longed every day more and more to get clear of the ownership of slaves. The only option he had for doing that at this point was to offer them for sale 
Virginia slave owners were unable to free their enslaved property until 1782, which I think a lot of people find surprising. As he explained a few months later, it would be a matter of very little consequence to me whether my property is in Negroes or loan office certificates, but in trying to decide about selling them off, he admitted to having scruples arising from a reluctance in offering these people at public venue and on account of the uncertainty of timing the sale well. He also believed that if these poor wretches are to be held in a state of slavery, I do not see that a change of masters will render it more irksome, provided husband and wife and parents and children are not separated from each other, which is not my intention to do. About a decade later, Washington refused to purchase a particular slave, commenting that he already had as many slaves as I wish, and that he was not willing to exchange others for him, because I do not think it would be agreeable to their inclinations to leave their connections here, and it is inconsistent with, inconsistent with my feelings to compel them. These scruples would have had important implications for the later management at Mount Vernon. During the war, Washington traveled to parts of the country which were in the words of historian Ira Berlin, societies with slaves, rather than the slave, slave society in Virginia and other colonies and later states um, in the South where Washington had grown up. Berlin notes that in the latter, so slave societies, slavery stood at the center of economic production and every relationship from the most intimate connections between men and women to the most public ones between ruler and ruled, all relationships mimicked those of slavery. By contrast, in New England and the Mid-Atlantic societies, uh, colony, excuse me, slaves were marginal to the central productive process. Slavery was just one form of labor among many. It was also during the war that Washington saw black soldiers in action, fighting alongside whites in the Continental Army. In fact, within se seven months of taking command of the army, Washington approved the enlistment of free black soldiers something he and the other general officers had originally opposed. They began in late 1775 by re-enlisting free blacks who had fought in the army previously and been let go, much to their disappointment when Congress disapproved of their presence. Five years later, Washington proposed a method for reorganizing two Rhode Island regiments, noting that objections could best be handled by dividing the black soldiers who made up the one unit evenly between the two and making up the difference with new recruits. So, quote, as to abolish the name and appearance of a black corps. In essence, integrating the army, something it would not be again until after World War II. According to one Hessian officer who fought against the Americans, no regiment is to be seen in which there are not Negroes in abundance. During the revolution, Washington was exposed to the views of several idealistic young men who opposed slavery and whose opinions he valued. John Lawrence of South Carolina, for example, proposed the formation of an African-American Corps in his home state after service in which the soldiers would receive their freedom. Early in 1782, when trying to determine what the British would do next and thinking that they might send reinforcements to Charleston, Washington wrote to Lawrence that I know of nothing which can be opposed to them with such a prospect of success as the core you have proposed should be levied in Carolina. Within a little more than two years after the end of the war, Washington's former aide, Alexander Hamilton, had become one of the earliest supporters of New York's Society for Promoting a Manumission of Slaves and signed a petition to the state legislator, state legislature calling for the abolition of the slave trade, something he referred to as a commerce repugnant to humanity and inconsistent with the liberal, liberality and justice, which should distinguish a free and enlightened people. Lawrence sadly died during the war, but Hamilton and another of Washington's favorites, the Marquis de Lafayette, continued to correspond about the abolition of slavery when he learned about the formation of the Manumission Society from a New York newspaper, Lafayette wrote to his former brother-in-arms that he felt the wording 
quote, against the slavery of Negroes was done in such a way as to give no offense to the moderate men in the southern states, an acknowledgment of the sensitivity of the issue in American politics. Knowing Hamilton's views on the subject, he noted that, as I have ever been partial to my brethren of that color, I wish if you are one in the society, you would move in your own name for my being admitted on the list. Between the end of the revolution and the start of his presidency, abolitionists began approaching Washington on the subject of slavery. Often they brought or sent pamphlets for Washington to read. By the end of his life, he had a small collection of these works by such authors as Anthony Benizet, George Buchanan, Thomas Clarkson, Brian Edwards, and Granville Sharp, written between 1776 and 1793. Over and over again in these years, Washington reiterated his conviction that the best way to effect the elimination of slavery was through the legislature, which he hoped would set up a program of gradual emancipation and for which he would gladly give his vote. As he assured his friend Robert Morris in 1786, he hoped that no one would read his opposition to the methods of certain abolitionists, in this case, he was talking about the Quakers, as opposition to abolition as a concept. I hope it will not be conceived from these observations that it is my wish to hold the unhappy people who are the subject of this letter in slavery. I can only say that there is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for the abolition of it, but there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished and that is by legislative authority. And this, as far as my suffrage go, will go, shall never be wanting. It was during this same period that David Humphreys, one of Washington's military aides from the Revolutionary War, came to Mount Vernon to work on a biography of his former commander. Although the work was never finished, it's particularly valuable for the notes Washington inserted, correcting errors and expanding on some of the story. A statement seemingly by Washington gives a good idea of where his thoughts were on the issue of slavery and his role as a slave owner as he stood on the threshold of the presidency. The unfortunate condition of the persons whose labor in part I employed has been the only unavoidable subject of regret. To make the adults among them as easy and as comfortable in their circumstances as their actual state of ignorance and improvidence would admit and to lay a foundation to prepare the rising generation for a destiny different from that in which they were born afforded some satisfaction to my mind and could not, I hoped, be displeasing to the justice of the Creator. On 29 December 1799, just 15 days after Washington's death at Mount Vernon, Reverend Richard, Richard Allen, a Methodist minister, it would be another 17 years before he founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church, took to the pulpit in Philadelphia to give a eulogy in Washington's honor. Coming as they did from a former slave, Allen's words are particularly interesting because they focus on the reputation of Washington as a lifelong slave owner. He began by noting that the nation was mourning in a season of festivity for the man he called our father and friend. He told his congregants that they especially had particular cause to bemoan our loss because Washington had been a sympathizing friend and tender father who had watched over us and viewed our degraded and afflicted state with compassion and pity. His heart was not insensible to our sufferings. He whose wisdom the nations revered, he whose wisdom the nations revered thought we had a right to liberty. Unbiased by the popular opinion of the state in which is the memorable Mount Vernon. He dared to do his duty and wipe off the only stain with which man could ever reproach him. Allen went on to laud Washington as a man who did not fight for that liberty which he desired to withhold from others, but instead let the oppressed go free and undid every burden. Recalling Washington's role in the revolution as his country's deliverer, Allen asked, by what name shall we call him who secretly and almost unknown emancipated his bondsmen and bondswomen, became to them a father and gave them an inheritance? The minister noted that deeds like these are not common 
and that God would openly reward such acts of benevolence. He predicted that the name of Washington will live when the sculptured marble and the statue of bronze shall be crumbled into dust, for it is the decree of the eternal God that the righteous shall be had in everlasting remembrance. Reverend Allen's lovely eulogy emphasized a provision in George Washington's will, which greatly impacted the lives of both his widow and the enslaved community at Mount Vernon. Written the summer before he died, Washington left, with the exception of a few specific bequests to others, the use, profit, and benefit of my whole estate, real and personal, to his dearly beloved wife, Martha Washington, for the term of her natural life. In addition, at the end of the same document, he also named my dearly beloved wife, Martha Washington, one of seven exec executors of his will, along with nephews William Augustine Washington, Bushrod Washington, George Steptoe Washington, Samuel Washington, and Lawrence Lewis, and step-grandson George Washington Park Custis. One of the primary duties Washington placed upon his executors was the emancipation, after Martha Washington's death, of all the slaves who had belonged to him. In accordance with state law, Washington stipulated that elderly slaves or those who were too sick to work would be supported throughout their lives by his estate. Beyond, going beyond the law, which decreed that male slaves under the age of 21 and females under the age of 18 be supported and maintained by the estate of the person who freed them until they reached their majority, Washington's will required that children without parents or those whose families were too poor or indifferent to see to their education were to be bound out to masters and mistresses who would teach them reading, writing, and a useful trade until they were ultimately freed at the age of 25. Washington's language concerning the importance he placed on these duties was forceful. And I do moreover most pointedly and most solemnly enjoin it upon my executors to see that this clause respecting slaves and every part thereof be religiously fulfilled at the epoch at which it is directed to take place, without evasion, neglect, or delay, after the crops which may then be on the ground are harvested, particularly as it respects the aged and infirm. As evidenced by Reverend Allen's sermon, the contents of Washington's will became known very quickly, both within the United States and abroad. Quoting a Baltimore newspaper article of 7 January 1800, the Massachusetts Mercury reported that Washington had directed the emancipation of his black servants and assigned them land for their support. Um, a writer in England took a more nuanced approach to the manumission, describing it as of a mixed nature, partly belonging to the patriot and partly to the master of the slaves on his estate, but still finding it humane, earnest, and solemn. The author felt that the will Quote, explains with infinite delicacy and manly sensibility the true cause of his not having emancipated them in his lifetime and should offer as a caution against those petty libelers who in interpret the whole of a character by a part instead of interpreting a part by the whole. We feel ourselves at a loss which most to admire, the deep and weighty feeling of the general principle of universal liberty or the wise veneration of those fixed laws in society without which that universal liberty must forever remain impossible. Or lastly, the affectionate attention to the particular feelings of the slaves themselves with the ample provision for the aged and infirm. Washington was no architect of ruin. I should, um, before I, I close and we open things up to um, to questions, um, I should say that the 123 people who belonged to George Washington were freed by Martha Washington on um, January 1st, 1801, so a little over a year after Washington died. Um, the 153 people who belonged to the um, estate of Martha Washington's first husband, Daniel Park Custis, were divided among their four surviving grandchildren and um, the 40 people who were rented from a neighbor were returned to their owner. Um, 
and um, that that's about it. We can open things up to questions now if if you have any. Mary, thank Mary, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating. Um, you know, I've looked through your book. It, it's remarkable uh, the the level of research that you've accomplished. I mean, it is just so detailed. Um, I'm interested myself, and and we'll take other questions. Let me look real quick and see what we've got. Um, uh, yes, it's being recorded, and it will be on our Redwood YouTube channel. So, uh, and that is to answer Elizabeth Morse, who asked the question, um, was the issue of slave Oni judges escape well known among Washington's peers? And uh, for those of you who may not know, Oni judge was the young woman who escaped. Uh, she was the sort of chambermaid to Martha Washington, and then she escaped uh, from Philadelphia and was, the only slave, uh, enslaved person that was able to escape, and the Washingtons um, spent a lot of time trying to recapture her. Uh, and there was an excellent book by Erica Dunbar that won many awards. Um, go ahead, Mary, tell us about um, about that episode. Um, um, it's sure. Sure. Um, Ona, the young woman was called Oni at Mount Vernon um, as a free woman. She said that she always said that her name was Ona, um, and the Washingtons were sort of you know, giving her a diminutive um, name. Uh, she left the Washington household in, I believe it was May of 1795 or six, 95, I think, and. Um, with the help of Reverend Richard Allen of the, you know, later the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, he helped her to, he and, and other free black people in Philadelphia helped her um, to get out of the city. She left um, on board ship um, and, and did not tell the name of the uh, of the captain who, who owned the ship or ran the ship. And he, he took her to um, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And she spent the rest of her life um, as, as a, she, she, you know, technically was still enslaved, but she um, lived free in, in the Newport area for the rest of her life. And we know she died in the late 1840s. Um, the Washingtons, uh, you asked whether the, the Was a lot of the Washington's friends and, and connections knew about um, her escape. The answer is yes, they did. Um, they, they knew quite well. Um, there was a, their household steward, Frederick Kitt put an advertisement um, in the paper noti noting the day she ran away, what she looked like. Um, it, it's invaluable because that's the only place we have a, a really good description of her physically um, and offering a reward for her return to the, the president's house. Um, so you know everybody knew, <laughs> and um, there was gossip about it. Um, around the time she ran away, one of George Washington's nephews, who was acting as a um, as a secretary, um, had a bit of a nervous breakdown, and he left the presidential mansion about the same time. So. There's a letter, I think, from John Adams, where he and a number of other people were having dinner together, and they were contemplating the idea that you know she had that Ona had run away with um, you know, Bartholomew Dandridge, who was Martha Washington's nephew, and um, there's no evidence that 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 was true, um, but a lot of people were talking about this situation. George Washington also. 
wrote to colleagues who worked in the government um, in some of the New England states asking them to, after he found out where she was, asking them to talk to her and try to convince her to come home. And um, Washington later sent one of, another of Martha, Martha Washington's nephews to, um, to uh, Portsmouth to try to convince her to come home. And by that time, Ona was married to a, um, an African-American sailor. Um, she had one child um, and they eventually had three children together. Um, and she, she was not going to go back. She had told the Washingtons that if they, basically, if they could promise her, um, you know, that she would be freed or that she, you know, that she could come back and, and work as a free woman, she would be willing to do that. And, you know, Washington wrote back and said, I, I can't promise her that. And um, he said, you know, for one thing, she is, because she ran away, she was less deserving of, um, you know, being freed than the other people who stayed and worked and were loyal. And so um, that didn't work out. And um, the family stopped trying to get her back. The, the, one of the reasons Washington could not promise Ona that she would, you know, that he would allow her to be freed was that she was a Custis Dower slave. He didn't own her. Martha Washington didn't own her. They were owned by the estate. And um, in theory, if they allow, you know, if they took somebody, if they, they lost somebody because they ran away, um, they could lose control of all of the Custis estate. Um, so land, people, money, all of it, um, which Martha's from the time she was 26 years old had been trying to keep together for the sake of whoever the heirs were when she died. Uh, Mary, you know, that story of Ona Judge is, is interesting because one of the you know significant reasons was that she is one of the few people that uh, whose testimony uh, survives uh, in in that uh, in that is recorded in in the historical record of of her experience. Um, and you have a couple snippets in the book of people. Uh, it's interesting to think about the the life experience from the other side, since the bulk of your book is from um washington himself their correspondence the the records of the plantation um what are some of the other sources uh and i know they there can't be many but um any other significant examples of uh enslaved people later recounting their experience uh in, in at the plantation uh there, there are some um, where all the feedback is coming from. <laughs> um, the, a, a number of the slaves talked to visitors to the estate, um, both during Washington's lifetime and sometimes afterwards, and um, would ask for stories about Washington and, and how he was as a slave owner. And so that's where some of these uh, stories about Washington come from. Other ones come from, you know, other relatives. Um, so Lawrence Lewis, I, I mentioned, um, Bushrod Washington, who was one of George Washington's nephews and also a Supreme U.S. Supreme Court justice. Um, visitors to the estate um, during Washington's lifetime would often, especially if they were from Europe um, and found, you know, they found those, those people were less accustomed to slavery than Americans were. And so they were very interested in, as an institution and would sometimes write in their diaries or travel letters to, to family back home about what they were finding 
in, in America. So there are not as many um, you know, sort of first person accounts as, as you might wish to find, but they're um, that enough um, you know, to, to really help us get a, a full picture of things. Um, in, in Ona's case, um, according to Phil Morgan, who is a, an expert on 18th century slavery, who teaches at um, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, um, Phil says that her recollection, she was interviewed twice in the 1840s when she was a, a very elderly woman, um, that her stories about this um, and her escape it's the only, they said it's the only time that an 18th century slave got to tell their side of the story, you know, why they left um, and what their experiences were. So it's a very rare thing to have. Uh, there's a question by Llewellyn Tolman. Jane Madison's uh, Montpellier is moving to have half of its board of directors consist of descendants of enslaved persons is Mount Vernon considering this? Is there engagement with such descendants at Mount Vernon? Um, yeah, I can't tell you what the board is thinking you know, um, about, you know, how they might expand. Um, we do have um, a contact with a number of descendants, slave descendants, and um, uh, you know, are working with them on programming. We worked with them. Um, they helped a lot when we were trying to set up Lives Bound Together, the exhibit we have had up since 2016 about slavery at Mount Vernon. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not quite. We, we, I can't can't really answer whether they're thinking of expanding the board, but I, I have not heard that they are. Um, at Mount Vernon. You know, I'm curious, I'm curious about, um, you know, you, you said you started on this book about 30 years ago. That's very early, you know, uh, a lot of this, these histories are really coming to the fore now, especially in the last year or two, uh, but over the last 10, 15 years, say, um, 30 years ago was very early in, in this sort of recovery of, of these, of these kind of um, well, the one would, might say the dark side of the founding fathers. Um, what was the response that you had 30 years ago when you proposed to do this? I mean, that the your peers and other historians. I mean, was there a why are you doing it? Or you know, I mean, I'm just curious as to the context of your early research so early in, in, in with this material, which is difficult to deal with. Well, Monticello was already way ahead of us at that point. And it was after um, a conference at Monticello about interpreting slavery at historic sites that my boss came back and said, this is so exciting and um, asked me to drop my research on food and <laughs> to start working on slavery. And she knew it was a topic that I'd studied in grad school and that I was um, very interested in working on. And so she said, go for it <laughs> um, and see what you can find. I think one of the problems okay. we had for a long time was that um, certain staff members were saying, oh, there's just not enough information out there for us to do a really good study of what life was like for enslaved people at Mount Vernon. And um, um, they, he, he'd never really looked, I think. Um, <laughs> okay, um, it's seven o'clock. I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you very much, uh, Mary Thompson, for this fascinating talk. This, this book uh, will be the definitive treatment, certainly. And um, I'm sure it will be well reviewed as I'm sure it already has. Uh, so I wanna thank uh, Mary, our speaker. Um, next week, um, you, I hope you will join us.
uh, as our attention turns to women and women writers in early America, and I'll be in discussion with Dr. Scott Paul Gordon, who specializes in transatlantic 18th century literature and history at Lehigh University. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, women in the colonial period, women writers, uh, the historiography, uh, the critical debates around that topic, obviously, whose history, uh, retold by whom. Uh, it is presented free through the generous support of the Jarzombek family, Marianne, Mark, and Michelle Drum, the good people who also sponsored this talk this evening. Uh, if you would like to view any of our past lectures uh, this season, please visit our YouTube channel for replays. Uh, I would be most grateful if uh, any of you might consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you're not members of the Redwood, now's the time to make the leap. So thank you all very much. And I wanna thank Mary Thompson and uh, to wish everyone a very good evening. Thank you all so much.